What we're going to speak about today is going to be very thought-provoking, and I want to give you all maybe a vision, uh, kind of what the world can expect in the years to come. How many people know about migraines? Raise your hands, please. Fantastic. So, migraine is one of the most extremely debilitating neurovascular brain disorders, right? 14% of the world suffer from it, and I have some interesting statistics for you all. In the U.S., 36 million people suffer from migraines, uh, 17 billion in healthcare costs, and worldwide, 324 million, right? And the cost is about $250 billion. Why am I saying this? The key to addressing migraine is to be able to predict faster. If you can predict, Dr. Van Gilder will say that we could actually intervene and have better efficacy in the treatment and procedures. So one of the things we want to talk about is kind of the Jetsons, right? I want to kind of share, and the, the panel will share some insights into what's happening in technology. Since I'm Indian, this is the next generation of a religious you know, sign. This is the new Bindi, right? And I'm going to show you what this would look like if this happened in five years from now. What I'm wearing right now is a fashion statement. Can you just project my phone? Okay, great. And this is a technology which can really scan my brain in real time. So if I wear this uh, for 10 minutes a day and go through a series of exercises, I can then start predicting what whether I'm going to have an incidence of uh, migraine or not. And if I'm able to predict it, the interventions I can take even before I actually have the onset of migraine. And this is going to be, I would say, game-changing, right? So imagine being able to go to work, be able to plan better. And what you see on this particular screen is actually my brain scan. And then you'll see actually the different signals coming up. So we, what we can do is now predict a migraine attack. How, how wonderful would that be, right? You can go to work, do your normal stuff, the second thing, this technology is from a company called Neuroverse, and this is once again the early days how digital technology can democratize healthcare. Right? There are a lot more examples that Dr. Daniel Kraft will be sharing with you all, but I want to give you all a glimpse into this. The second thing, so I'll take off my fantastic, this is a really f amazing device. Right? The second example over here I want to talk about is the second leading cause of death for young adults in the country, in the United States, age of 10 to 34, is suicide. We have an all-time mental health crisis, right? In the state of California, we have 1,135 psychiatrists who are looking at young adults and adolescents for a population of 10 million children, right? So we know we cannot have enough physicians or, or doctors to really address this crisis. So we have to look at digital health. Technology, like Deepak says, is neutral. How we use technology is up to us and how it can actually serve the masses and make it work for us, right? So what I want to kind of share over here is a scenario. Let's say, and this actually happened, I was working with, Dr. with Arthur Blank and the Blank Foundation. Montana has the second highest suicide rate in the country after Alaska. And yes, there's different issues with addiction and there's gun, and all different issues with mental health, but one of the biggest issues they have is not enough people who can help the farmers in remote rural Montana, right? So an idea I have is that, Ram, let's say you're wearing your Google Glass, which you can wear it now and show you how it looks like. And if you had the John Deere salesmen who actually go to all the farmers and meet them at least once a week, what if he, could, he or she could now talk to the farmer in a remote place in Montana, stream the video to a remote control center, maybe at Walmart? Right, with Walmart Health, and now a behavioral health person can coach the, the John Deere salesman to say, you know what, hey, bring John Smith in. I think we need to kind of talk to this person. And that's really the vision, I think, uh, for this panel, to really increase your awareness and share some of the trends in digital health and technology. So with that, let's kind of uh, do a quick round of intros, right? Ken, you want to start with you, right? We have a clicker. So. Go ahead. Start. Yeah. All right. Um, let me pull my slides. Hi, I'm, I'm Daniel Kraft. I'm a physician trained in internal medicine, pediatrics, hematology, oncology. I chair medicine for Singularity University. And I'm going to kick off this little element about uh, digital health and bit of some framing of where things can go in, in healthcare uh, and move it from where we really are, which today is sick care. Um, and what do I mean by our sick care model today is where we sort of wait for the migraine to happen. We have a very 
uh, world of intermittent and episodic data. You know, you get your occasional uh, labs or blood pressure or EKG inside the four walls of the clinic. Maybe you have high blood pressure, hypertension, uh, diabetes. You're sending your data to your physician, whether they want it or not, by fax or by PDF. So with intermittent and episodic data, today we end up in a sort of reactive sick care system, waiting for the heart attack, the the headache, uh, the stroke, or in my world of oncology, uh, patients to present with late-stage disease. And I think part of the potential of this new connected era of digital connected health is to become much more <clears throat> continuous, proactive, personalized, and to bring care almost anytime, anywhere, uh, arguably at lower cost, and democratize where healthcare can happen. And we're now in an era of connected devices, whether it's brain-computer interfaces to look at your, your brain waves, to uh, smart watches that can do your EKG, that really lead us to an era where we can be in a world of continually monitored uh, health. Now, it can be a little overwhelming. Our digital exhaust can be connected. Um, and the challenge is, is, what do we do with that in this new era of, of digital health? Still a bit of a buzzword. I think we'll soon call it health. But the opportunity is to now take some of the new exponential data sets from your genome to your digitome, uh, personalize that to you, and now apply a whole new layer of, of applications and services. So if you're in rural Alaska uh, to even uh, in your home, you can start to uh, have insights and, again, be proactive and move from, from healthcare to health. It's not a panacea. Just giving someone a Fitbit doesn't mean they're going to lose weight. We're seeing new centers grow and academic centers to study the outcomes and, and new platforms as they come together. But it just gives us new opportunities to do healthcare in different places, whether it's bringing healthcare from the four walls of the hospitals, your home, to your phone, to inside your body. I, as a clinician now, or you as an individual, can start to use a, a digital doctor's kit, essentially, in your pocket, integrated into your smartphone. We're in the era of digiceuticals, where you could prescribe an app for, for mindfulness uh, or to manage a, a common disease or a complex one. Um, so it's a really interesting time now where we're able to re reimagine and reinvent many elements of healthcare. Again, prescribing an app all the way to uh, prescribing a, a telehealth visit. And you know, this even now extends to the world of, of discovery. We can all not just be organ donors and blood donors, but data donors, connecting the dots, the ability to do a clinical trial uh, almost anytime, anywhere. In fact, uh, Apple uh, just came out yesterday with a new uh, research platform where you can uh, join a study on hearing or women's health or cardiovascular uh, disease. In fact, Stanford recently announced a study. Uh, they had 400,000 folks sign up on their digital health clinical trial uh, and found folks early who had issues like atrial fibrillation from their smartwatches. So, Digital health, mobile health, connected health, it's a really interesting time. Things are moving relatively quickly. Uh, I think the big opportunity is to move from this era of, of new data, which can be overwhelming, turn that into actionable information that you as an individual, a consumer, a clinician can use. So that becomes actionable information in real time and narrows that gap, which is now often <coughs> 17 years from publication uh, to clinical utility, uh, and really move us into a, a, a new emergent era of, of healthcare anytime, anywhere. So that's a brief summary. We'll talk more on the panel. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. Ken. All right, thank you and good morning. So I'm going to try to channel some of the wisdom of my students back at MIT. As I speak, I've got students in a lab. I'm running a class where students are building virtual and augmented reality applications. And I had the great pleasure of hosting Deepak in my class last year, a version of it I ran last year, where he looked at some of the applications the students were building and the problems they were solving. And he saw many connections to digital health and spoke about them. And that's the, the genesis of uh, my having the pleasure of joining you here today. And actually, if you look at the list of students I have on this intro slides here, these aren't just students from MIT. I have the pleasure being in Boston of being near many wonderful other educational institutions. So I run a cross-disciplinary class with students from the Berkeley College of Music and from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And when I listened to some of the words from Deepak earlier this morning about emergence and collaboration and about how scientists ask what's going on and sages ask, who's doing the asking, I realized that the question of who's doing the asking, who are these students I'm bringing together in my classroom, is maybe one of the most interesting parts of what I'm doing. It's a deliberately a radical collaboration environment, multidisciplinary teams, very different levels of age and experience and demographics. It's an intentionally unstructured curriculum. 
It's not like I have to make sure they all understand differential calculus before they get out of my class. This is an opportunity for them to come and play and bring to bear the skills they've already learned by mashing them up with skills of others. And it's a very entrepreneurial environment. We're hoping that students will take these projects and make them real. So all I want to do for now is show you sort of a menu of some of the projects that I see recur when I ask students to think of virtual and augmented reality and how we can go into new worlds using technology. And I'll be around the next couple of days. I'll look forward to talking to you all. In fact, the students are meeting this afternoon in a lecture hall, so if any of you are really interested, maybe we can rig up a Skype and get in there now. Um, I've got folks taking care of the class for me, and I'll be eager to hear what they're working on. But obviously, the, the work in inner peace and meditation, work on phobias, anxieties, and kind of learning how to have a steady hand in challenging situations. Uh, empathy is an interesting one, and the question of whether virtual reality is an empathy aid, whether by embodying as somebody else or going into somebody else's environment, you can better appreciate what's going on. And since we're in this beautiful art museum, I should highlight one of my student projects involves going into the mind of the artist. So you can do a virtual tour of an art museum, and when you get in front of a work of art, you can sort of click through and go into that work, then you go into the artist's studio, then you go into the artist's imagination, and you can kind of go on a whole psychedelic odyssey of what was going on in the artist's life that brought that work to bear, and then you come back out and you're back out in the museum. <clears throat> um, so again, I, I mostly just wanted to show you this list. I don't have time to do justice to these all, but it's a, it's a wonderful set of students who would, would love to talk to you all, I'm sure. So we'll think of ways to build more radical collaborations in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Tom? Thanks. I'm Tom Van Gilder. I'm an internal and preventive medicine physician and teacher. And for about the last 18 months, I've had the pleasure of being the chief medical and analytics officer at Walmart Health and Wellness, which I hope you've all had a chance to learn more about. I'm happy to discuss that a bit more later. In 1816, a young French physician changed the way he interacted with his patient in an effort to preserve her modesty. At the time, auscultation, or listening to heart and lungs, was done by direct application of the physician's ear to the patient's chest. Dr. Lenek didn't find that acceptable for this particular patient, so he took a tube of paper, put it to his ear, and listened to her chest, to her heart, to her lungs that way. That was the inst institution of the stethoscope, which was commercially available just a few decades after Dr. Lenek came up with his idea. It's become the universal symbol of medicine, of medical care, and I think it gives three important lessons for digital health and health technology in general. One is that solutions need to come from real problems. Too often, I think, in digital health and health technology, we have solutions in search of a problem, and we tend to impose them on a situation rather than listening, understanding the problem, and then devising a solution that meets, addresses, and solves that problem. Secondly, the solution that was eventually to become the stethoscope grew out of a patient-physician <coughs> relationship. It wasn't imposed on that. It enhanced that relationship. It grew out of that relationship rather than, again, being imposed on it, interfering with it, disrupting it, which all too often, again, today in our technology, it designed to improve health, disrupts that, that intervention, disrupts that relationship in, I think, harmful ways. Thirdly, the technology, the tube of paper, enhance the patient's experience, enhance the physician's experience as well because it allowed technology to develop that allowed us to do a better job of listening to our patient's hearts and lungs and diagnosing things more precisely. But it also was a, an effort to improve the patient's experience of care. And all too often the technology that we develop is done to try to help patients, but without regard for the, the experience that they have of care, the experience that they're living, and all too often ends up interfering and leading to either harmful interventions or interventions that just aren't engaging and so are left, left to the side. So the three lessons, I think similar to some of the lessons we learned this morning about relationships in general, technology, technology should solve problems, not impose solutions should grow out of relationships, particularly in health technology, the clinician-patient relationship, and should enhance a patient's experience of care, not interfere with it or discard it. Looking forward to the further discussion. Thank you.
Ram. Yeah. Right, thanks, Pranja. Um, great to be here. Isn't, isn't this place beautiful? Right? I mean, really, credit to you. Great place. I can see myself getting lost somewhere in the afternoon walking around. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ram. I'm from Google. And um, I work on a product called Google Glass. Um, Punacha made me wear this for a little while, but yeah, I have to take off my not so smart glasses and then wear my smart glass, I guess. Um, what this is, is, uh, is basically, think of it as a computer, um, which you can wear. It's got almost all the similar kind of components that um, you would find in your phone. It's got a touchpad, so you can swipe, do some gestures. It's got this display where I can see some uh, instructions. It's not big enough, great enough to read an entire email or watch a movie or something like that, but it's good enough. Um, it's got microphones, it's got a bunch of sensors, um, it can hear me, it can you know, use technologies like Google Assistant. Um, and it's got a front-facing camera, so use cases like the one that Punacha mentioned about uh, someone remotely wearing this and, and maybe talking to a patient and uh, a doctor or somebody else, an expert, uh, half the way, uh, half, halfway around the world can see a, a video and then they can have a communication and collaboration. So, uh, the glass device has been around for a while. I'm sure some of you must have heard about it. Um, and then internally what we have done uh, is we've kind of focused the use cases on enterprise and healthcare and medicine is kind of enterprise use case. But uh, I think what's more fascinating is why, why have this device? Right? Why is this probably the right time to have a device like this? And, and the way I like to look at it is um, I think we have all settled down on the phone being our primary computing device. Right? I'm sure, I mean, scientists love their phones. I'm sure sages have phones too. Um, <laughs> and, and we all love them and we probably can't live without them. And more and more of our life revolves around what's, what we're doing on the phone. The other thing to keep in mind is this is true from uh, at least a couple of hundred years since the beginning of machines, is that the human being has always had to learn how to use the machine. Um, I do the laundry once in a while. My wife tells me not as frequently as I should be, but I'm standing in front of that machine and I'm trying to figure out the knobs and the buttons and whether I'm going to ruin my t-shirt or not, or will this thing come out the way I expect? So, since the beginning of machines, the, the paradigm has always been that the human being understands the machine. Uh, over the last few years with technologies, particularly around uh, natural language processing and a uh, little later AI and ML, we've gotten to a point where technology can now understand the human being. So if I could stand in front of my washer and say, hey, could you please take care of my favorite t-shirt, do a gentle wash or whatever, and then it understands and then does everything, that'd be pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> I think we are at the beginning of that journey, whether you use uh, an Apple, Siri, or Alexa, or Google Assistant. I would, I would be biased and say that Google Assistant is the best, but whichever one you use, that's, you're beginning to experience that. And now when you look at use cases where you are, uh, you are in a function where you need to be completely hands-free, like a doctor or a surgeon, um, but you could help with some computing uh, power around you. Today, surgeons, I'm told, when they perform surgery, sometimes they're using some implants or something that's really technologically advanced, and sometimes they'll look at a, a monitor and then look back. Uh, think of the use cases where you could be wearing something like this, getting some step-by-step -step instructions in terms of computing help, and being completely hands-free, and it be able to understand you as a human being, uh, and whatever natural language you're speaking in. So I think that's what we're looking at from a wearable perspective, uh, wearable computing. The technology is there. There are hospitals in California where the doctors are using this in the offices. Um, it helps them look at vital statistics. Uh, it helps uh, transcribe their voice. Um, I do though have a few friends and relatives who when they see a device like this on the doctor, they're like, why is my doctor wearing this weird thing? So I think there are still some steps in terms of um, acceptance, but I think we'll get there. And hopefully on the journey that we are with this kind of technology, it will, it will definitely help with health, medicine, 
uh, surgery and overall well-being. So that's what I work on, and I think it's a pretty cool space, and so happy to be here. Thank you, Ram. Yeah. So the format going into the next uh, 20 minutes is going to be a series of thought-provoking questions, so each one of you all can respond. Uh, you all different areas of expertise. I'm going to open it up with the first question. 400 million people globally suffer from diabetes, right? It is a huge problem. It's a global problem. Um, and if you really look at the problem, the, also the second part of the question is, every 20 seconds, there's an amputee, amputation because of diabetes. In the United States, half of them don't live over five years, right? How can continuous monitoring and technology and digital health address the diabetes epidemic? And I would love for either Dan or anybody to kind of pick it up and let's have a conversation around that. We may all start. I mean, part, part of the opportunity is now we can redefine diabetes. We're mostly talking about type 2 diabetes. It's really, uh, in, in, we're now in this age of personalized genomics and proteomics and beyond. We're starting to learn that there are at least three distinct genetic subtypes. So first of all, we can start to uh, relabel diseases in a new, more precise way and then start, as you mentioned, start to monitor it continuously. You can now almost over the counter get a continuous uh, glucometer. The, the, the real potential then is really to get insights as an individual about your, let's say, your blood sugar levels, how those relate to your activity, uh, your meals, and then start to optimize proactively to manage that disease. But I think we can even move super proactively. Now we can identify who's a pre-diabetic and put them into a social network online, give them a connected wearable, a scale, a company called Amada Health is doing this and prevent them ever from becoming a type 2 diabetic in the, in the second place. But where it gets you know, uh, interesting on the, on the disease side is now we're able to collect blood sugars from millions of people in real time, get a, a picture of what that looks like, and then hopefully optimize and have a feedback loop that really uh, gives them better blood sugar control, uh, prevents that hot spot on their foot with a connected sock that can determine uh, before they get a lesion there and need an amputation. Lots of new ways to connect the dots, and that care can start to happen anywhere, anytime. And Daniel, I think the only thing I would add to that, which is very much in line with what you're saying, is that information can help, help an individual and his or her team, doctors, friends, all of the above, to make better moment-to-moment -moment decisions, because diabetes and the complications really are end state and they're the result of daily moment-to-moment -moment decisions. So when you have the information, have the support, have the action items in front of you, you can make better choices. And also to, to, to tune that, we think about personalized medicine for precision interfaces. If you're a 70-year-old or a 17-year-old with type 2 diabetes, you need a very different way of communicating. The, the millennial wants to Snapchat with their doctor and have badges and points. The baby boomer may want a whole different way to interact with their, their data, whether you know, it's in the pharmacy or in their home. Quick question, you mentioned socks, I love that. <laughs> so e-textiles, Fibertronics, mm -hmm. uh, how is that going to change healthcare? Because I, nowadays I know there's textiles where, based on my mood, it can actually change the color, right? And we have designers, Rachel Roy is a designer in the audience, maybe the people over here can talk about what's the future of textiles in healthcare? Well, beyond text, it's the idea of, of not just wearables, but invisibles, the ambient environment, whether right. it's Wi-Fi measuring your vital signs or your socks or uh, uh, yeah, you know, your camera. Um, it's going to give us new ways to collect data and then use it proactively. And I should also point out that I, even though I was talking about virtual reality, which is largely a visual <coughs> experience now, there are people working on other senses that bring into that. So on wearables, I have a student who's brought out a, a wearable device that gets hot or cold on command or in response wow. to various biometric signals. I have another colleague who's working on aromas and, and sort of creatable smells on the fly. So you have something near your nose, which depending on what's going on, it will create a different scent for you to experience. So to the extent that some of those can create behavioral changes or get you better aware of your own situation, I think that's gonna be interesting to see come forward. Next question, gonna, this is gonna be an interesting one, especially from a Google perspective. September 30th, 2014, there was in a Dallas hospital, there was a Liberian who was diagnosed with Ebola. October 1st, there was 6,000 messages per minute on Twitter. <clears throat> in 2008, Google predicted an uh, in basically a flu outbreak. Mm -hmm. What is the future of social media in the prediction of outbreaks of disease? Uh, I mean, social media is, I think, the, the manifestation of the, the, the data. Um, if, the show, the, if the data is all generated by human beings, if a million human beings are talking about the same thing, then social media has a way to provide reach and amplify it. Um, <clears throat> but I think what is behind that may be a little bit more intriguing in the sense that 
Um, uh, today, when the, the paradigm is you go see a doctor, and by the way, I'm not a doctor, but um, say you need a scan or you need some diagnosis, <clears throat> and it's a one-to-one -one mapping of some kind of a diagnostic test and the experience and expertise of the doctor, and he or she says, oh, yeah, I think you need this or you don't need anything. Think of a time when uh, if there is an online database of millions of the same diagnostic test, and instead of depending on one human being to look at that, or the human being taking the time and effort to look at it, you have a data of, uh, say, the same diagnostic test, and you can, in 360 degree, analyze the whole diagnostic, and before the doctor enters the room, and say, listen, the model says this, the doctor, which is the human, will say, my, based on my wisdom, this is probably what you need. Then you get to maybe catching things much earlier. Um, and once you have that kind of capability, yes, we are still not there. There's some privacy concerns and concerns. You guys were in the news for privacy. Uh, uh, yes, I can't talk about it. <laughs> but, but the point is, if you get to that point, then you, you are not just dependent on that doctor or the doctor's ability to read that. And then you can find a way to you know, put it social media and spread it out when you have outbreaks and stuff like that. Daniel, Tom, any thoughts on this, on social media and the future of predicting disease? Any thoughts on a big data, AI? I think the, the, the notion of AI and other disease models and algorithms predicting or even intervening uh, is, a, is a sound one, and I think we'll see more and more of that. I think where there's a wonderful book called Designing Care by Richard Bohm, who's a New Zealand physician and now I think a business um, school professor either at Harvard or MIT. But he talks about the, the, both the, the macro trends of disease identification, Ebola is a great example of that, but also the micro trends of a particular diagnosis for, for a patient, where the level of uncertainty is broad and the, the swings of, of diagnos diagnostics and interventions are broad, that get narrower and narrower, and as you get closer to the actual diagnosis where you really understand the disease, the algorithms can really take over. And that, that frees up the physician and other care team members to think more broadly, to establish the relationships and to really understand the diagnosis more deeply. I think it goes beyond, I mean, you can get signals from social media, get from people, you know, from, on flu trends, from searches, you can tell how many people were buying, you know, cold remedies at Walmart, and that can give you a map, even in your zip code or neighborhood, of right. what might be going on. It might even give you a, I'm about to beat, meet Thomas for, for lunch, and don't shake hands with him today, he has a 98% chance of influenza. <laughs> and that sort of data is becoming available, you know, from mining your social network. Definitely privacy issues, but the whole ability now in this era of big data is to start sifting it new ways, and uh, so if I'm doing a, a if someone's showing up in my office or doing a telehealth call, I know where they live. I have some context. It may even give me guidance about what antibiotic or antiviral might be most relevant instead of sort of one-size-fits-all uh, prevention or therapy. So we'll just key on that, on that particular topic. So Africa has 28% of the world's health burden, right? But only 3% of the health workforce. Mm -hmm. How do we, how can digital health and technology, what is, how can we take telemedicine to the next level? How do we also in increase engagement of patient and the physician in a telemedicine environment. My favorite example, and you mentioned the stethoscope. You know, now, you know, I'm not, I went to medical school, I listen to lots of hearts, still not very good listening to heart murmurs, but now I, I've got some props. You know, now you can get a little, you know, digital stethoscope, this one's called the Echo, it will listen to your heart, does an EKG, uses AI, can diagnose heart murmur better than a highly trained cardiologist, and that could be used in a rural clinic in Africa by a community health worker or the patient themselves, and now there's even you know, AI-driven $2,000 portable ultrasound. So you can start to bring diagnostics to rural Africa or rural Arkansas, uh, and that can upskill anybody to be a diagnostician and then potentially enable you to bring in a digital therapy or deliver that by drone. So I have a really specific question for you. So um, I know Walmart Health is, is kind of transforming or really kind of looking at uh, the whole retail health experience. What is your vision? How do you see this really bringing healthcare and democratizing it to everybody, right? I think the important lessons that we can learn from retail is delivering to people what they want, where they want it, how they want it at an affordable price. Engagement, filling needs is, is really at the heart, is at least my understanding of, of retail, and is at the heart, I think, of, of some of Walmart's success. And what we hope to do in Walmart Health is, is replicate that and, and do so by listening to people, understanding the community needs, mm -hmm. meeting them right now where they are, which is in oftentimes in Walmart stores, but also extending that into their homes, into the communities, maybe starting with the health center, but 
really quickly through technology and other means, getting into people's homes, meeting them where they are, even there, which, by the way, the retailers are doing now as well, delivering food, uh, perhaps even medications to people in their homes. So I think that that retail experience is one that healthcare is lagging behind in, you know, I think Daniel sort of alluded to it, that we're really very passive as physicians. We wait for people to come to us. We wait for diseases to develop. Uh, what retail teaches us is you have to understand what people need, want, and meet those needs, how and when and where, and how they can afford it. I guess the patient will see you know paradigm is really happening now with right. Walmart Health. Right. Awesome. So the next question, which I thought was relevant, so Raphael Grossman, I think, was the first sur surgeon to kind of use Google Glass to basically have his surgery kind of streamed out, right? Before that, typically when a surgeon did a surgery, there were two students looking over the shoulder. Now the surgeon is doing surgery, and it's streamed to people all over the world. Hundreds of people are watching it. Beyond education, are there some very concrete use cases where AR, VR, MR technology will disrupt or augment digital health? And I saw actually one example of the example when I was at Exponential Medicine, you were talking about it. <coughs> Any thoughts? Um, yes, I mean, I, one of my favorite examples, I was involved in a few pilots uh, a, f a couple of years ago was around pain management, and there were studies around, um, today when you do pain management, you know, as you progress, not in the right direction, then you just increase the pain medication. There were some studies where they used uh, virtual reality, and based on the images, the videos, images, and sounds that the patients were watching, the, their need for the pain medication was dramatically reduced. So that's one use case. Um, surgeons um, streaming the video and it going around the world and say, um, you know, kids learning about surgery is great education, but it can also be um, a, a helpful tool for the surgeon himself or herself. Um, um, step by step instructions, or if uh, he needs some backup help, a second pair of eyes, use his voice, wake up the device. Uh, those are all things which are real. They're happening today, as you mentioned. Um, so I think that's, that's where the future is. And it, it, wearables is one thing, but I think what we're all trying to accomplish is um, some kind of ambient computing power. And every time I talk about it, all my friends say, you mean like the Iron Man and how he has the yeah. big screen and he can and talk to it? Uh, yes, I the think next that time is... I'll come an Iron Man suit over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that's, that's where we are headed. And as long as the technology is, is enabling and helping, uh, I think it'll be welcome. Danny, I think the most exciting example where this is going to head is, yeah, you can have your Google Glass on right now and, and have someone pour it in and give you some guidance in real time. Now with a, you know, AI machine learning, you can record a surgery, um, start to glean, let's say you're doing a laparoscopic taking out a gallbladder. You can see yeah. where the dangerous parts are. You can start to give real-time guidance, sort of like a exactly. Google Maps or ways to the surgeon through the procedure step by step. And that's going to you know, get the knowledge of you know, thousands of surgeons in, in, in real time as opposed to sort of, you know, you got, you got trained at Mass General or Stanford, you have a certain way of doing it. Yeah. And so building that sort of uh, um, guidance, not for the robot to take over, but kind of the yeah. cobot yeah. element. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, sorry if I can yeah. quick one. So you talked about, you know, access to physicians in, say, Africa. The access to the, the, the doctor himself or herself is one thing, but what kind of technology do they have? Many times in, in poorer countries, there's no computers, there's sometimes not even electricity. So, uh, and, and Google has done this a few times, right? So uh, our mission is, our vision is around uh, you know, making the world's you know, information accessible to everyone. So if the same thing works for health information. So Ken, just a quick question for you. I know you talk about VR, AR, and biofeedback sensors. Quick thoughts? Yeah, so when you spoke about education for doctors, certainly um, getting them to do practice runs of that surgery. So not only is it good to have live advice or a ways like interface while they're doing the surgery, but to be able to do a few practice runs even down to the basic science they're learning. We have an experiment underway at MIT right now where our freshman physics class is asking students to play a video game. It's a VR game where they become electrons. It's called electrostatic playground. So they become extremely small and they learn um, physics theories by experiencing them firsthand. I think doctors can learn about what's going on in the body by doing that. Um, another, um, you asked about biometric feedback. There is another experience where you take someone through a challenge which gets easier if they can make themselves calmer. So for anxiety or for meditation, 
Um, they, they get direct feedback as to how well their body is responding, which you can do through galvanic skin response or any number of other markers. So if you have five minutes, less than five minutes, so that... Quick extension on that. Now, you know, at Stanford, there's something called virtual heart. As a medical student or cardiology fellow, you can walk inside the heart, see the anatomy, see the oh. problem area, so you can learn in a visual way. And then if you show patients, I mean, many people have high cholesterol, hypertension. They don't see what that's doing to their kidneys or their brain. Now you can visualize your own anatomy, and that gets people much more adherent to their statin or their blood pressure medicines. So quick responses for the next few uh, questions which I'm going to ask is, should I get my genome sequenced? Quick. Sure. Yes, I even have my own socks made for a base of my genome. You can have the oh, wow. down. Those are very personal socks. <laughs> All right, now I that's, mean, that's geek. Bias. It, it's, still, it's, still, it's still early days. It was like you know, $10 million, now it's $600. The challenge is how do you translate that to the workflow of the clinician? Let's say you walk into the pharmacy, you should have your, your pharmacogenomics done as part of the workflow of the pharmacist and doc. You can certainly know your um, heritage, but also what risks you have. So the future will be when you are walking to your primary care clinic, they're going to know your risk of heart disease or cancer and be much more tuned to how you do prevention proactively. Any thoughts? I think yes, but more as a uh, civic responsibility so that we can learn. There's so much still to learn. Mm -hmm. Thought we would know it all by cracking the code. We still have a lot to learn. Okay, second question. Can an algorithm diagnose better than a physician? Yes. Yeah, I like to say, you know, the AI is not going to replace the doctor, but the doctor using AI replace the doctors who don't. And then now the pharmacist, the physical therapist, the nurse practitioner will be able to replace the physician in many cases using algorithms. Uh, maybe from a chemical standpoint, but I'm still a believer in uh, the power of, of human observation and okay. that for more complex situations where you really have to know the patient, the proverbial bedside manner, I'm not ready to okay. let go of that. I, I would say I think the, the, the human, the doctor has to be the final, has to have the final word on it, but if technology can help the doctor make the decision faster, better, more efficient, then sure. In the future, will we see nano robots swimming through a bloodstream? And give me an example of what that'll, that'll look like. Uh, well, things are getting exponentially smaller. Yeah, now, not exactly through your bloodstream, but you can swallow a pill that has a camera in it and Bluetooth yeah. that can analyze yeah. your GI gut and maybe even do therapy. Compliance and all. Um, so we are seeing uh, the era of sort of micro devices um, that will live inside our bodies or sensors underneath our skin that can do 24-7 uh, continuous monitoring. Okay. So closing thoughts, everybody's going to have one, one answer to one question. What is the one breakthrough digital health technology you see coming out in the next five to 10 years? I think here. it'll be vir uh, applications using virtual reality. Okay. And some of them were discussed. Any particular examples you see in VR, which will be useful in a clinical setting? I think the two that are most exciting are being able to deliver uh, behavioral health, mental health uh, processes for people who don't have access otherwise, and surfacing uh, physician and other clinician thought processes and, and learning uh, more experientially and keeping them up to date. Any insights from the Dallas Georgia launch that you can share about right now or not really? Well, I'll, I would just say this, that it's re been remarkably well received by the community and, and all the modalities are coming to life and the, the teams are working together in, in really a wonderful way to help individuals. Fantastic. I'd say if we want to move from you know, sick care to health care to health, uh, layering a lot of these technologies and converging them so that in five, 10 years, you have sort of your own personal health care coach or concierge that understands you, knows your genomics, knows your behavior elements, and gives you nudges, hopefully proactively, before you end up getting disease to optimize your diet, your mindfulness, your uh, social connectivity, not in an overwhelming or big brother way, but to start to give us that sort of layer where health is sort of integrated into our daily lives. And when you do have a disease, it's much more connected and, and personalized. I think in mental health, as you were saying, the ability to embody as someone else in some other world and give patients the agency to create that new world for themselves in virtual reality is really going to be a game changer. Rob? Well, I like all the answers, but um, I, I think the most impactful technological change could be around um, the big data and some kind of uh, AI enabled by machine learning, which makes data available to both patients and healthcare professionals much more seamlessly and helps make better, faster decisions. If I could add one coda, yeah. I mean, technology can be overwhelming and sometimes get in the way of patient care. You know, physicians now spend too much time on the EMR. We hope, hopefully some of these will get, make the user experience uh, much more seamless and, and, and sort of uh, upskill and enable the clinician and the patient to be much more connected, uh, not overwhelmed. So I have seven seconds. I want to thank Deepak, my friend and mentor, who basically said the future of digital health is first of all predictable. If you can predict it, you can personalize it. If you can personalize it, you need to have a process. 
If you're a process, you need a platform. And you know, a platform, you get people to participate. Thank you. That's the future of digital health. Thanks. Thank you.